We're just going to change direction here for a few moments. Uh, Ms. Rhonda Rita is the Executive Director of the Ohio Oil and Gas Energy Education Program and the Ohio Oil and Gas Energy Education Foundation. Prior to assuming a full-time position in December 2007, Ms. Rita served as Vice President of Internal Affairs and Public Information for Ohio Oil and Gas Association for more than a decade. Early in her career, Ms. Rita worked for the independent oil and gas companies in the private sector. Collectively, she has more than 20 years experience in the crude oil and natural gas industry. Ms. Rita also currently serves on public outreach Outreach Committee and the Interstate Oil and Gas Compact Commission and the Colonial Drake Well Historical Oil 01 Steering Committee. She is an active member of the Independent Petroleum Association of America, the Society of Petroleum Engineers, and the Ohio Geological S Society. Ms. Reed has served on the White House Task Force on Energy Education and has received numerous state and national awards for her OOGEEP efforts, including the Friend of Science Award from the Science Council of Ohio, the EPA's Ohio Environmental Education Award for Outstanding Program, the Ohio Department of Natural Resources Minerals Education Award, and the Interstate Oil and Gas Compact Commission's Public Outreach Stewardship Award. Ms. Reed is a graduate of both Ohio University and Edison State College. She lives with her husband of 25 years and their daughter and son. Welcome, Ms. Reed. I can move this up just a little bit here. Uh, really want to appreciate the opportunity. I know it's great outside and appreciate the invitation from the board. Don, thank you very much for contacting me. And uh, more importantly, thank you for spending your evening uh, listening to uh, my discussion on oil and gas. Um, it is a, obviously a big topic uh, today. What I'm going to try and do, I'm going to give you a little idea of what uh, my organization does. And by the way, we utilize, you can go ahead and flip, um, we're a nonprofit. Uh, we do not utilize a single taxpayer dollar in any of our programs. And we're very proud of that um, because everything that we do. Uh, it should be up to our, our industry to fund. We do not take federal grant monies. We do not take state grant monies. So again, uh, we're very proud of that fact. Um, I have been in the oil and gas business for almost 25 years. Um, and for me, I went from a for-profit company to a non-profit and tried to create uh, one of the country's very first education programs. Um, primarily, uh, that time, my daughter was in first grade. She's now a junior in college. Uh, my son uh, was almost in kindergarten. He's a senior uh, in high school. I'm going to be an empty nest. I'm terrified about that. Um, but when they came home, uh, my daughter uh, was taught about the oil and gas industry and uh, that famous picture of the oil and duck. And this is what she thought I did for a living when I said I, I was going out on the drilling rig or I was getting out in the field or going out on a well location. She had this in her mind that uh, I was going out and uh, killing animals, including the water. And you know what? I don't care, you know, with your mother, aunt, grandfather, father. It's mortifying uh, when your kids don't want to be around you because they think you're doing something terrible. And frankly, for me personally, it was one of the reasons why uh, we took the leap here in Ohio to create this kind of education program. We do not own or operate any wells. And so just this year alone, although we don't primarily do public speaking, it's one of the reasons why my voice is very hoarse. We've done almost 140 public presentations. And I have to start out by thanking you guys very much because a couple weeks ago, uh, I was at a meeting and they were actually wizards in the room, dressed up in wizard costumes, and uh, so just so that you know, the wizards here in the state of Ohio have officially declared uh, that they are opposed to oil and gas drilling. I just thought you should be aware of that. Um, our teacher workshops, um, I think that this slide may have gone, uh, I'm just going to very briefly, I'm thrilled to hear about some of the education programs. Uh, Ohio is one of the very first states to create uh, 
science programs in our classrooms in the school, primarily K through 12. And right now that program has been recognized across the country. Why did we do it? The reality is science scores are some of the lowest, not only here in the state, but across the country. We do not have kids pursuing careers in geology, engineering fields. Uh, my sister owns a dental lab, but they can't find kids in the dental field. Um, it's very, very scary. Uh, for our industry, the average age is 55. I'm 50, and I'm considered one of the youngest in the industry. And if we don't start encouraging kids to pursue science careers, all this great geology that we have here in the state of Ohio will be irrelevant. So we do offer free teacher workshops to the teachers. It meets state and national science standards. Teachers get CEU credits, and they can also get an optional graduate credit. 100% of it is paid by us. We'll put them up overnight, and paid by us, that means donations that we receive. We'll even put them up all night, and then the next day we take them out in the field. And if you saw some of those pictures, We'll take them out on the drilling rig, we'll take them out to the production site, we'll take them on a frack job, just don't use the word K when you spell it. Um, we'll take them out on the compressor station, because there's something very special about an educator being able to talk to her students. And there they are standing in front of the pump jack, and being able to say I was actually here, and getting these kids really excited, uh, not only about science, but also uh, about energy in general. You can go ahead and play. Um, state science fairs, I did want to bring this up, this is big science fair time uh, here in the state of Ohio. I've been a judge at the state science fair, working with the Ohio Academy of Science now for about 15 years. This is, uh, I call it the equivalent of a state athletic competition. This is the best and brightest science kids we've got in the state. These are the kids that we want to pursue careers in the energy industry. What's interesting is our very first science fair winner now works for me. And uh, so we do start tracking these kids at about seventh grade level. You can go ahead and click. Uh, from there, uh, we do want to encourage kids by financially supporting them. Uh, these scholarships do not go to the college. They go directly to the student, um, which is extremely important. Um, and again, this is where we can again start tracking them, looking at internships and looking at job placement. And so these are very critical areas. Five years ago, I had a full ride college scholarship to give out at the science fair from Marietta College, which is one of the oldest petroleum engineering schools in the world located here in the state of Ohio. I couldn't find a single student project to give it to. And so it's very disappointing. Go ahead. Um, workforce and industry training, uh, we take this very, uh, uh, very serious. Um, in the last year and a half, we have put about 1,400 workers through specialized safety training. Uh, our business in the field, it can be extremely dangerous. Uh, it doesn't matter whether it's 10 degrees below zero or 110 degrees out. Our wells operate 365 days a year. In some cases, there's a lot of heavy equipment. And so we're constantly uh, doing workforce training uh, to the industry. The other big thing about Ohio is we also have the opportunity to bring some of the latest technologies into the state. And uh, that's what we also bring uh, uh, with our industry training. Uh, fire training, uh, why do we do this? Uh, again, you're going to hear me say this constantly, Ohio being the first. We're the first state in the country to create an emergency response training program about 12 years ago. Why? Well, the reality is there was not a lot of emergencies. You have not heard about a lot of emergencies here in the state of Ohio. It's about being proactive, okay, and to make sure that our uh, fire departments are well trained in the event that there could be an emergency. You can't say that there's never going to be an emergency, but why not be proactive? We've spent more than a million dollars and have trained over 800 of our fire departments here in the state of Ohio. Uh, we are now working with seven other states that want to use Ohio as a model, which is pretty neat. Uh, the Ohio Fire Chiefs Association has officially endorsed this program. So again, it's just another place where Ohio has been the lead. So let's get into uh, the main topic here. Uh, what I am going to do, talk a little bit about energy needs and then I'm going to give you a crash course on how we drill, explore, complete, and produce oil and gas here in Ohio. Uh, as you can see from the slide up here, 
Uh, we are currently using 100 quadrillion BTUs of energy each year. And I did get stumped on a question. Uh, there's 15 zeros in a quadrillion. I really did not know that, and I did get stumped on that. Um, these are incredible amounts of energy. And if you think about it, Ohio celebrated its 150th anniversary of the first commercial well. Uh, um, and it's taken us 150 years to go to 100 quadrillion. Uh, in less than two decades, we're going to jump to 124 quadrillion. What you don't see changing your much is the pie chart. But the reality is, look at some of those. Uh, the coal's in trouble. You know, I mean, you go down on that list, coal's in trouble by 2015. But coal right now is making up over 20% of our energy needs. There's no one energy source that can do it all. And we should not put all of our eggs in any one basket. We do need to look at some renewables. And in the right places, you know, they may work but they should not be subsidized. Not any of the wells here in Ohio, I don't care what anybody says, there are no subsidies. When you go out and you drill an oil and gas well and you get a dry hole, you got a dry hole, okay? And I'm gonna get a little bit into the science, but you're also not gonna spend five to $10 million until you've done the science, okay? Because you should read, uh, making a profit should be a bad word, but also, if you're being subsidized, um, somebody else needs to make um, those profits back. So there are no wells that are subsidized here in Ohio. Uh, one of the scary things most people don't realize, why are we going to jump to 124 quadrillion? Well, the reality is it's technology. 20% uh, of our electricity use today is just for computers. We did not have computers in homes 20 years ago. In fact, uh, the company I used to work for, we operated several thousand wells here in the state of Ohio, as well as New York, Pennsylvania, and West Virginia. 20 years ago, our mapping department, one of our budget items was colored pencils. And our mapping department sat there with colored pencils. I mean, technology is incredible. How many don't have a cell phone? You know, then we've got all these gadgets and iPads and Xboxes and Playstations. And the two hardest things to explain uh, when we do these presentations is number one, what's going on five to 14,000 feet underneath the ground, because we don't look at grass, doesn't help us. And number two, that energy doesn't come from those two little slices in the wall. But the sad thing about it is today, when we go do projects in the classroom, these kids really do believe that milk comes from the grocery store. You know, there was a letter to the editor, it has nothing to do with, do with oil and gas. Uh, I think it's relevant, it's during hunting season, and my family are a big wildlife and, and a hunting family. And uh, it was a letter to the editor, and it said, to all you hunters out there who hunt animals for food, shame on you, you ought to go to the grocery store and buy your meat there where no animals can be harmed. The difference today, we're not using hollowed out tree trunks as our casing in the ground. And the first natural gas pipelines in this area were also hollowed out tree trunks. So again, technology has come a long way. This gives you an idea of where the 64,000 wells have been drilled. Last year we drilled out 460 wells. And what's hard to believe, in 1981, we drilled over 6,000 wells in one year here in the state of Ohio. We will never drill 6,000 wells again here in the state of Ohio. People are talking about this boom. We're not going to drill 6,000 wells. And I'll get a little bit into horizontal drilling here in a second, but if you think about what horizontal drilling alone is, you're taking one vertical hole and then you're going to go out horizontally about a mile. That's going to replace 32 individual vertical wells. So you're reducing the environmental footprint today with a single hole that's about 25 inches in diameter. And we're getting phenomenal reserves. 
Um, last year, we produced 73 billion cubic feet of natural gas here in the state of Ohio, and almost 100% stays right here in the state of Ohio. We do not produce enough yet to satisfy all of our own energy needs. Ohio is the fourth largest consuming state of natural gas. And seven out of every 10 homes use natural gas, which by the way includes propane, uh, as a heating source. And we're a big industrial state. Go ahead, please. Uh, I left these uh, maps for you in the back. Uh, this is a... Uh, <coughs> I'm really trying. Uh, this gives an idea of just here in your county. Uh, we have drilled over 3,200 wells uh, in the county. There's currently uh, 345 producing wells. Uh, last year, just in this county, produced over 4.6 billion cubic feet of natural gas. And you did hear about a lot of problems out there. Uh, about 234,000 barrels of crude oil. Not a huge crude oil producing state yet. And I'll get to that here in a few. And just uh, royalties to local landowners last year alone was about $5 million, which adds obviously to the local economies. So what is petroleum? Um, petroleum is two things. Uh, it is, uh, uh, first of all, is an organic substance. It's just old plant and animal life. I mean, that's all it is. That died in over millions of years. It was buried, buried, buried. It was cooked. It pressurized. And it turned into either a liquid or a vapor. I mean, it's pretty simple. Uh, the liquid form is called crude oil. Um, this is uh, crude oil. Uh, this is from a well about a half a mile from my house. Okay, uh, my son and his buddies are making some extra money for me. Uh, right now in my office and we've got some teacher workshops coming up so they're in our office filling these with turkey basters. Uh, we're not exposing them to any you know, toxic poisons or anything. This is what oil looks like, Ohio oil looks like on water. Uh, what you'll see if you come up and look at this, if I let it settle out, you'll see a very thick uh, layer. This is uh, paraffin or wax. It's one of the first things that's taken off in our crude oil. This is where we get inks plastics, cosmetics, uh, motor oils, lubricants, a um, lot of different products, and I'll show you a picture of that. Refiners like it because it's very easy to refine. Now when you get out to like California, their oils are real thick, it's almost like mud. But they refine a lot of asphalt out of that particular crude oil. So not all crude oil goes into fuels, and only about 20% of ours is actually made into any fuels. Uh, natural gas in its pure form, you cannot see it or smell it. Uh, when it comes up out of the ground, it's one of the reasons why we intentionally ignite or flare that natural gas. We have to have an idea of what kind of pressure we're dealing with. So for the fire departments, we tell them, don't you dare put that fire out. Very, very important. Uh, every well is going to be different. Okay? So that's your official definition. Uh, of uh, petroleum. Uh, uh, why did we start uh, uh, drilling for oil and gas? Why was crude oil even important? Very brief history lesson. A gentleman by the name of Dr. Kerr out of Pennsylvania took this crude oil over an open flame, okay, and uh, he learned very early distillation. <laughs> and he created something called kerosene. Next slide. Why is kerosene important? Hard to believe, but 150 years ago, whale oil was still a fuel choice, even in this part of the country. And it was that whale, or it was the uh, discovery of kerosene by, distillate, uh, by distillation uh, that replaced the whale oil. And I love this uh, Vanity Fair cartoon, April 20th, 1861. It is the whales celebrating the discovery of crude oil. So I don't care what anybody says, we help save the whales, okay? <laughs> From there, um, they also learned that crude oil could be made into a lot of other products. There was a lady by the name of Mabel Williams who took that same crude oil over an open flame, created a black residue. Her company today is Maybelline. If you look up here, Vaseline used to be sold as that paraffin. 
What is Vaseline? It's pure petroleum jelly, and I'm telling you, it's still awesome on chapped lips, scrapes, and burns. I mean, it, it's really good. Uh, what's really interesting is they also used to use it for a lot of uh, uh, different kinds of medicines. And as you can see, uh, here's a label up here at the top. I had a fire chief over in Stark County. Uh, they had to demolish a home, and he found a whole case of uh, this bottle of crude oil uh, hidden. And you can come up and look at it. It was used. People would drink it straight up as medicine. I mean, nobody ever died. Probably clean their pipes, no pun intended. Okay? Um, but I kind of like the grape and cherry flavored stuff. But this one's really funny because it says, uh, fit for man or beast. So. You can go ahead. This is uh, refined today, and we don't have enough time tonight. Okay? So, and uh, from there, go ahead. Um, I like this picture because it was from National Geographic. And what I like even uh, more is that this is a Stowe, Ohio family. And this gives you an idea of all the different products that are made from uh, uh, crude oil today. Now, crude oil, much different than the natural gas. A natural gas can also be used immediately, but prior to it coming into your home or business, we are going to add a chemical. Not all chemicals are bad. And it's a more captive, it's an odorant, so that you can smell it. It's a safety component. You want that there. Uh, in addition to that, today uh, we also produce a lot of what we call wet gas. This is why, as I get into the unit share, why you are hearing so much discussion about processing plants. Uh, the wet gas, this is where we get propane and butane and pentanes, helium, all these different <laughs> gases uh, come out of that. So a lot comes out of uh, the petroleum product. What I'm going to try and cover is four main phases. Uh, leasing and exploration. Uh, we're going to get into uh, drilling. Uh, then we're going to get into uh, well stimulation and completion and also uh, the production side. Now today, people are calling this entire thing fracking with a K. Okay? Um, it is not fracking. Hydraulic fracturing is one of 75 different professions needed in order to produce oil and gas. That's how many different professions are involved. Okay, go ahead. Um, this here uh, uh, gives you an idea. Here in the state of Ohio, there's over 30 different geological formations that we can currently produce oil and gas out of. Uh, in Ohio, we have uh, uh, great water in the state of Ohio. Uh, that is uh, located very close to the surface. As I said, I got a well half a mile from my house. I don't have a royalty or working interest in that well. I don't want oil gas in my water well either. And neither does anybody uh, around here. Very good water, very close to the surface. Now below that we get into some of the sandstones. Uh, this would be a relatively shallow well here. You hear a lot of talk about the Marcellus. Uh, the Marcellus, there's only a couple counties in Ohio that have Marcellus. It is not deep well drilling. And it's primarily only natural gas. And which is uh, right now with natural gas prices where they are, uh, you see a lot of the activity slow down the Marcellus Shale. Um, down here, uh, below that, we get into the Clinton Sandstone. Debbie, would you mind bringing those samples up here for me? And then um, uh, down below here is the Utica Shale. And down here, this is where we get into the Trent Black River, Beacon Town Rose Run. And, and I can keep going on and on. There's a lot of different geological formations. So primarily you're going to drill into a sandstone or a shale because they're both porous rocks. Most of your water wells, mine included, is in a sandstone or a shale. Because it's a porous rock, that's where the water is. More than likely, you will get a show of natural gas or the chemical name is methane in almost all water wells. Okay? It has not been down there long enough uh, to produce it commercially. A sandstone, I want you to think about this as like, you come up and look at these, think of this as like a sponge. Okay? You know how a sponge has a bunch of different holes in it? It's exactly what the sandstone is, only these are microscopic holes. And um, you've got to have the ability to look at the porosity and permeability of these rocks to look at their ability to flow. Okay? Uh, very, very tight sand. The Utica shale, this is a piece of the 
Utica shale. Shale is much different in that, think of this as like a book. And a book has a bunch of pages, and it's literally one layer after another. Okay? The problem is if I took this shale, we broke it up right here. I've done that many times. I don't have many good core samples left of doing it. Or this, we would get a little bit of oil or natural gas out of these. And you can see the difficulty is that they are trapped in these hole spaces. When I talk about hydraulic fracturing, I want you to think about these geological formations. And I brought some frac sand from a job I was on a couple months ago. Um, think about how difficult it is to place grains of sand in between each one of these layers. We also do the same thing when we're hydraulically fracturing sandstones. You got put grains of sand in order to open up the whole spaces. It's an awesome science, and it's, uh, it's really incredible. So just think about that as I get through the presentation here. Okay. How do we get to the Bears Rock Formation? This is uh, green in Ohio. Uh, this is very typical of what you saw in Ohio. Um, and these wooden derricks would stay with the well for the life of the well. And you would simply drill one well on top of another. There was no regards for spacing or landowner rights. And uh, today, uh, we have spacing laws. Um, before you can ever drill for oil and gas, you must have permission from the landowner. And in Ohio, that must be 20, 40, or 80 acres. The deeper the well, the more acreage you must lease. In a horizontal lateral, it must be at least 620 acres. Today, we know the approximate area in which it's going to drain. As a landowner, you should be compensated for any minerals that are taken from your property. Okay? As an oil and gas producer, I am not going to jeopardize a $5 to $10 million investment to go 10 feet over someone's property line. I mean, everything's very, very precise. So, uh, again, this is very different. You can flip to the next one, please. Uh, today, instead of drilling one well on top of another, and by the way, not all states are spacing states. Okay, I think I, I love spacing walls. It, it really is about the landowner's rights. Today, we're going to rely on instead of just drilling one well on top of another, we're going to rely on a lot more seismic. Seismic is nothing more than sending sound waves down into the ground. Every time it hits a new geological formation, it bounces up a signal. It takes just a few seconds, goes down to the next layer, bounces up a signal. Why is that important? Well, today, go ahead and click. Uh, from there, um, these are what the, I refer to this as our industry's first set of EKGs. This is where the geoscientist areas come in, geophysicists. Um, this is 2D uh, seismic, this is 3D seismic. See this layer here, what we see in the seismic? We're pretty excited about that. It just doesn't look like a whole lot that will be looking at it. Okay, we're really, really excited. Now the company I used to work for, we were the first one to introduce 3D into the state of Ohio, and actually we drilled, uh, we had 10 wells drilled in Ashtabula County, and six, the first six wells we drilled were all dry holes. So we were not real thrilled with the 3D seismic. It has come a long way. Why is that important? What we can then do is take that seismic, and we can start creating some really, really neat thickness maps. Uh, we get an idea of how thick the rock is, how far it extends, for a horizontal well, you want a nice, thick piece of rock, a couple hundred feet, that's going to extend out at least a mile. Okay? You also want a very thick piece of rock if you're going to do it vertically or directionally. And why is that important? Why aren't we going to drill those 6,000 wells again? Let's say this green here is the Clinton sandstone. We missed if we drilled here, didn't we? We missed. Let's say this green is also uh, the Utica Shale, and we need to go out a mile. We went this way. We missed, didn't we? Uh, Ohio, uh, in terms of the Utica Shale, we're going to continue to drill in many geological formations. In terms of the Utica Shale, we are in the leasing and exploration phase, and we will be in that phase for several more years here in Ohio. Uh, there is no rush to drill these uh, when you look at the expense. This, these maps are just incredible. So you have to do the science first. So even if somebody's property is leased, 
doesn't mean there's no guarantee that we're going to drill a well on that property. If the science doesn't look good, if we set up over here and the Utica, for example, pinched off after 30 feet, okay, even though it picked up another 100 feet over there, that's a bad well. So the science is extremely important. 30, 40 feet make a difference between a good well and a dry hole. Go ahead, please. Again, uh, uh, this is a map. Uh, I also left this map for you in the back of the room. It doesn't show every single geological formation, uh, but I just wanted to point out that we left it back there. Go ahead, please. This is uh, another map I left. This is uh, just the Utica. This is a thickness map of just the Utica alone. Why are we excited about that? It covers a significant part of the state of Ohio. We will be drilling for oil and gas in the western part, probably not in five, six years, because the infrastructure is not there. We're going to be starting in the eastern part and moving our way over. This is just incredible. And the thing about the Utica, unlike the Marcellus, it's just natural gas. The Utica, again, we've got natural gas, we've got wet gas, and we have crude oil. <coughs> Uh, the other neat thing about the Utica Shale, uh, the other geological formations are known as reservoir rocks. What we now know about the Utica is it's the source rock. It is the source rock that helped feed the other geological formations. That is why we we'll get phenomenal, I mean phenomenal reserves uh, out of the Utica clay. Uh, yesterday versus today, uh, today you're typically going to see a drilling rig. Um, I don't care what your property is, you can never tell landowners that it's going to be quiet. Uh, this is a large piece of equipment that will be on the property if it's a vertical well, 7 to 10 days. If it's a horizontal well, it will be there at least 30 days, depending on how many laterals. Okay? These are things that you work out with the landowner. This is 24-7. You cannot shut down the rotary drilling rig. You could jeopardize the integrity of the well bore if you do. And landowners should be aware of that. Uh, some things landowners should, depending on the time of year, uh, they have, may have to be compensated for crop damage. Uh, you do want to go back and reclaim the area. Think of this as a very short uh, construction period, uh, very short time frame. Um, again, uh, how long does it take to build a building like this? So about 30 days, but again, you should be aware of that. Well construction, this is the Thorold and Key Well. It's a pretty muddy day when we were out there last, uh, last year. Um, this here in Ohio, this is where the first discovery of oil was in the United States. So if you're ever traveling uh, down 77 near Maxburg, stop in and see, 1814. And it is still producing oil today. Not a lot. Uh, but again, the casing is, uh, is this hollowed out tree trunk. Go ahead. Today, this is what uh, well construction looks like today. Um, this is very important because, uh, uh, number one, the most important thing is to protect our aquifers. It's critical. Okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to uh, drill uh, what we call a conductor hole. Then you're going to set a surface casing into the ground. And then it's going to be followed by layers of, uh, of cement. And there will be multiple layers of that. And what they're going to do is form a permanent seal to completely shut off these aquifers. Now, every well may be uh, just a little bit different. Multiple casings put in place just in the event of a casing failure. The state has to come in, sign off, say you've got a good cement job, a good casing job, and then you have sealed off the aquifers. Only then can you start going down to the geological formation that you want to drill to. So several layers of steel pipe and cement in the ground. This one's just a little bit easier to show. Um, again, you can start, the largest hole is going to be about 25 uh, inches, and a vertical well might be a little bit uh, smaller. And then uh, by the time we're physically into the hole, you're about five and a half inches. Okay? So that's how big we're drilling. That's all the space it is. So by the time you line um, this with steel pipe and cement, and if it's a horizontal, you're just simply going to go this way, steel pipe and cement, all the way around. If you think about it, we can't even get any oil and gas out. <coughs> We've sealed off everything. Drilling crew's gone, cement crew's gone, 
a uh, new profession called uh, perforators. They come in and they will perforate the pipe only uh, in that geological formation. They'll put a few holes in the side of the pipe. Now, under pressure, under millions of years, the oil and gas can only go one way, and that's up the uh, well bore. Now, horizontal, you're going to bring it out this way, and then you're going to perforate the pipe so that you can produce it all along the entire geological formation. Okay. From there, um, the perforated crew's done. Go ahead. Uh, from here, uh, we are going to uh, do production enhancement, or today people call this hydraulic fracturing. Why? Um, well, first of all, how we used to fracture the rocks. Um, prior to 19, uh, 1952 here in Ohio, they would drop dynamite or nitroglycerin down the well bore. And you see the movies where you've got the oil shooting up out of the ground, so it'll shoot the well. That's how you fracture the rocks. Okay? Um, go ahead to the next one. In uh, here in Ohio, this is actually Hartville. Uh, you can see uh, this is uh, 1954. A process was introduced in the late 40s by a company I'm sure none of you have ever heard of by the name of Halliburton, um, <laughs> who developed a process. So instead of putting nitroglycerin or dynamite down in the well bore, they uh, developed a process that with sand and water under very high pressure, you can fracture the rock or create small fissures, which is really what it is. Think about these grains of sand. And it replaced the dynamite or nitroglycerin underneath the rocks. We do use some chemicals, and I'll get into that in a few minutes. What people say, well, it's changed today, it's different. It's not any different today. Today, our goal is under high pressure, put sand and water in the well bore to create small fissures. The only difference when you do it horizontally, it is physically impossible to fracture out a mile at one time. So what you're going to do is you're going to fracture, put a plug in it, fracture, put a plug in it, fracture, put a plug in it, and now you're going to release it. So why do you need to do that? The easiest analogy I can give is a can of pop. And everybody's done this. You take a can of pop, you shake it up, you go like this. Okay, it's fun. You can spray it on someone else unless it's you. Okay? But if you think about it, you've released pressure out of that can of pop. Remember that oil and gas is inside oil and gas formations. But just like that can of pop, after that pressure is gone, most of that pop stays in the pan. Same when we drill an oil and gas well, you're going to get an initial show. <coughs> most of it's going to stay there. That's why you must fracture the rocks. All wells worldwide are fractured. Go ahead to the next one. So again, it's very difficult because these are, you know, microscopic holes that we're putting in here. Uh, but this can make a difference between a dry hole and a producing well. Today, you are not going to drill a well unless you complete it through hydraulic fracturing. And uh, we've done it here in Ohio 80,000 times. Across uh, the country, 1.2 million times. There has never been a case of groundwater contamination and hydraulic fracture. You're just putting sand into the rock formations. Now, has there been cases of groundwater contamination? The answer is yes. And that's usually been in the well construction part where they may have had a casing failure because you can never say never on that one. Hydraulic fracturing, we can actually say never. The chemicals, we left you a list of this. Um, the easiest way, you can look at the chemical list. Ohio is a full disclosure state. Um, and the best way I can explain it, why do we use the chemicals? Yes, every company is going to use something different, just like different people like different detergents or, or cars or anything like that. Three primary reasons we use a chemical. Number one, we just spend all this time protecting the well bore, right? Make sure that we're protecting our aquifers. Well, if you know anything about sand at a very high pressure, it can cut through glass. So what we're going to do is add something in there as a friction reducer to protect the well bore. You want that to happen. Number two, we're going to use, uh, typically it's guar. This is the guar plant. And frankly, some of the ice cream uh, shops are very upset with us right now because we're using an awful lot of this agriculture plant. Um, it's used in gravies and thickeners and in ice cream. Uh, what we need to do is take that grain of sand, 
and it has a thickener we call a propin, and it helps carry it into those geological formations and holds it there. The third type of chemical we're going to use is something to kill bacteria. People say, my goodness, why would you use something to kill bacteria? Why well, don't care where your water comes from, all water has bacteria in it. Doesn't mean that it's bad. All water has it. When you introduce that into these virgin reservoirs, bacteria likes to eat hydrocarbons. The other thing it'll do is bacteria will start forming clusters and it'll start clogging up the holes we just created. Okay? That's my dog fracturing. I wish I could make it sexier, but that's all there is to it. Okay? And to tell you kind of how ridiculous it's gotten out, oh, would you mind not clicking on this animation? Um, this is what's changed too, is that we can look, if you use like the mouse,
Last year, if you look at all the revenues from the other taxes we pay in the other geological uh, formations, a billion dollars to the state in different taxes, and some say that is not enough. Go ahead. Jobs and personal income, uh, these become very big. We are now working with almost every community college career center uh, across the state uh, because this is what we're concerned about. One of the reasons why we did the economic impact study is you also do it to identify holes in your infrastructure. We don't have the workforce training. And where we're really going to be hurting is going to be the skill, the welders, the CDLs, the machinists, the diesel mechanics, well tenders. These are going to become very high paying jobs because the demand is going to be incredible. But we are looking at about 200,000 jobs. And to give you an idea, we fell way below our projections here. Uh, we created about 8,300 jobs last year. Pennsylvania's numbers came out. 229,000 jobs was the real number. And the neat thing about that is 70% of those jobs were Pennsylvanians. Okay? We don't anticipate anything different. There's still going to be a headquarters uh, that could be in Oklahoma City or Houston. Okay? I was in Houston uh, a couple months ago. I never thought I would be sitting in Houston, Texas, looking at maps of the state of Ohio. It's incredible. Go ahead. And then this you can just click through real, real fast. These are different careers. And we do have a career list for you guys. This is where we think the biggest demand is going to be. Um, again, as I said earlier, there's 75 different jobs. Um, I've got two slides left. If we truly want to be less dependent on foreign energy. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Every community that consumes should produce. Maybe you don't have a geological gift, but do something because this is this is something we hear all the time. We should be less dependent. We should be less dependent, but nobody's willing to step up to the plate and do something about it. So every community that consumes should produce.
um, that the state of Ohio has said the earthquakes that happened there, a series of earthquakes were supposed to be related to fracture, according to that uh, Ohio representative, Bob Hagan. So I wonder if you could uh, comment on those three issues. Thank you. Um, and if I forget, there's, uh, I'll try to go through that. Um, first of all, hydraulic fracture, every well worldwide is going to be fractured. Okay, every well is. Um, an oil gas producing well. Um, so, um, uh, you know, hydraulic fracturing, again, it's just not something new. Uh, we were at an event that I actually had a lady that, um, um, it wasn't the same meeting with the lizards, but actually stood up and said that we were putting halofragilistics in the water. And um, uh, so, hydraulic fracturing is going to be long, so how long is it going to last? Using today's technology, uh, the estimates, we're anticipating, this is only saying we're going to get 5% of the reserves out. Okay, I can't wait to see where we can take hydraulic fracturing into the future. Okay, and some of the animations and stuff, I mean, it's really neat. So right now, we're only looking about getting 5% out. Okay, and technology will help them. Most of these wells, based on what we've seen, similar plates. We're not really looking at the Marcellus because that is just natural gas. But you look at the Balkan up in North Dakota, um, they've got 7,000 homes waiting to be built in North Dakota. Um, when you look at the Eagle Bird in Texas and Barnett Shale in Texas, those are very similar geological formations. It's about 20 to 40 years is a good life expectancy on any well. I think, again, it's that technology and we are able to fracture more. So these are long term. You cannot physically produce an oil and gas well in, um, you know, sometimes I see a three or five years. So every day, um, you have to drill wells. And this play, um, like the other geological formation, I mean, the Clint, we've been doing that for well over 100 years, that formation. No reason to believe we will not be drilling into the Utica for a very, very long time. So at least more than a century. As it relates to the earthquakes, and I didn't really get to, um, in Ohio, uh, down in the same geological formations that contain oil and gas, uh, is also salt or brine water. Sometimes it's called oil and waste. Ohio was covered by ocean at one time. In Ohio, back in the 80s, uh, uh, the state said, and, and I agree with this, so they used to be able to discharge out of lakes or streams. Okay? We do have some good, very good environmental laws. Obviously, you don't want to do that. So all brine. Um, must be disposed of into a class two injection well. There's other class uh, injection wells for other industries, but ours is a class two. The earthquake in Youngstown, and I do, well, I'd really like to, am I, can I show that map? Because I actually put it in my presentation. I tried to cut her down, there was no way I could cut her down. And Don told me that, and I said, no, I can't do it. He didn't believe me. <laughs> Look at he's fighting. I can see that. This is uh, where the 181 injection wells are currently located in Ohio. They're strategically located. Oftentimes, it is an old oil and gas producing well that's no longer producing, um, but because it's a porous rock, you're basically returning that brine or salt water back into the ground where it came from. The well in question in Youngstown was intentionally drilled as an injection well. They wanted to be able to take some of the Pennsylvania water, and the reason why we're getting some of the PA water, they are just now coming into compliance in terms of some of their oil and gas regulations. And so um, the next one uh, slide here, um, if you see where Mahoney County is, see the other circles around the state? We had over 400 earthquakes in the state of Ohio last year. Uh, most people don't realize that. Was it appropriate to shut it down? I think so. And here's the reason. We talk about porous rocks, porous rocks, porous rocks. They believe when they drilled that well that they were into the basement rock, which is like um, granite. We all like granite countertops these days. That's a non-porous rock. So they believe that they could have put pressure on a non-porous rock, which may have caused that earthquake in Youngstown. It was the right thing for them to do. Other questions? Yeah. Um, so, uh, is, is anybody um, in your organization or any other organization working with the banking industry and the insurance industry? We have gotten gas leases in the last six weeks. Now, I'm all for energy. I promise I'm all for energy. But we all talk.
talk to our banks and all of our banks, every single bank, key, Bank of America, Citigroup, Countrywide, two federal home loan um, companies, all said they have a policy prohibiting any loan officer from providing a loan on any residential property that has a gas lease attached to it. Furthermore, five of them said that they will immediately call in our loans if we assign a gas lease. Also, all of our insurance companies told us that it would nullify our homeowner's policies and we would have to buy a high-risk policy that is literally four times, four times the cost of the policy I currently have. Is anybody working with those guys to, to make them give loans or to make them not cancel our policies? First of all, I had a legal brief done on that and you're more than welcome to a copy. We had a legal brief done on uh, all the loans. There is only one place in one loan, and that's an FHA loan. And the only restriction in the FHA loan is that they cannot close, it's, it's kind of weird language, they cannot close on a house while the drilling is going on, the drilling only. So it could be a seven to ten day period. So the answer is with all the banks we're working with, um, that is the only one where we've got an exception. When it comes to liability, if there's an insurance uh, claim, uh, it is not the property owner's liability. So if, and we've talked to the insurance industry, we have been talking to the banking industry, so if there is an agent there trying to raise premiums, um, that is absolutely um, something that they should not be doing. The full liability, all doing. I'm saying that this is one of the reasons why people are out there doing that. People are looking at a way to capitalize this in any way that they can. Well, so then the true cost, when you state the true cost, the, the value to Ohio, I'm setting here um, and uh, from okay. a pure if financial you're Asian, perspective, I'm sorry, please. Yeah. Um, the $1 billion doesn't turn into $1 billion when we all have our uh, homeowners policies quadruples okay. and when we So what I'm trying to tell you, let me finish, because what I'm trying to tell you is that if your agent and with your home is trying to increase your uh, insurance policy because there's a well on the property, that would be inaccurate. 100% of that liability is not on the homeowner. None. We are, Zero. We are partners in. We are partners in that. The liability is on the oil and gas operator, and it should never affect. Uh, the insurance liability of the homeowner. I don't disagree with you, but all 11 insurance companies all told us the same thing. We will cancel your policy immediately, and you will have to buy a high-risk policy. So, so we've had companies. wells and properties for 150 years. So if they're just doing that, that's been within the last year, and, and I'm telling you right now that that is absolutely wrong. Well, as soon as they figure out how to, how to identify that you signed a gas lease, they will start canceling policies, and that's the problem. The only problem Sir, I would disagree have. with you. Uh, I work with hundreds of thousands of landowners across the state, okay, and, and hundreds of thousands. They all tell us that. And, and <laughs> I'm just saying that that is inaccurate. They can't do that. Why would they all tell us that? Okay. Let me ask you something on the homeowner for you, Ron. Is there typically some sort of hold harmless and indemnification uh, clause in the agreement with the property owners? That is going to be a part of the lease agreement that would be uh, uh, specifically spelled out. Every lease agreement is different. What we tell landowners right now, especially, is number one, do not sign a lease contract without seeking a qualified attorney that's very familiar with mineral rights. We've seen some of the lease agreements go from seven pages to 50 pages. They're very complicated. There's also a lot of different um, uh, landowner groups. Um, some of these are wonderful groups where they are putting together some of the acreage, especially for in some of the Utica play. Um, and it's very, uh, very important that it qualify, but it would be spelled out in the lease agreement and also in the liability. The lease agreement, the lease agreement is between the uh, property owner and that when that is signed, it is between the surface and mineral rights owner and whoever that oil and gas producer is. So it is going to buy indemnification uh, within the lease agreement that releases that homeowner of any kind of liability. That oil and gas well, you gotta think of it as like a business, okay? And that oil and gas producer just happens to have their business on someone's property. But that business 
the entire liability falls on that oil and gas producer, not the homeowner. Somebody else? Anybody? You know, I'd like to give people who are, is there anybody here who's directly impacted that has a question or, from, the, from the neighboring community? No. Okay. Greg? NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement, requires Canada to sell all of to us, and we agree in return to pay them whatever they're going the world market rate is. What do you have to say about that? Well, the reality is uh, in the United States, we use about 60 million barrels of crude oil a day. We don't produce enough to satisfy all of our own energy needs. I think agreement is the Keystone Pipeline. Um, I don't have any problem with that. Who sets world prices right now is OPEC. And the reality is we are price takers, not price makers. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. The lady in the back behind me. Um, hello, based on that same subject, I was Googling some items, and I mean no disrespect to you whatsoever. I know you work for that industry for 25 years, and I would expect you to be pro that industry. I, I, so I love the industry I represent. You should. <laughs> yes. Um, but what I've been reading is that our top export in 2011 was oil and gas. And that is in a lot of publications that the U.S. is using less, we're consuming hey. less, but it's our top export. So, you know, you keep saying that this is to get us off foreign dependency, and yet it was our top export. Well, we, we imported uh, the bulk of our oil, what most people don't realize, was actually from Venezuela. And so uh, I, I, I'd like to look at the article in terms of the top exporter. Uh, we're definitely not going to see that in the natural gas side. Um, you're not going to see natural gas you would need to liquefy. That, you know, we were talking about putting in a lot of LNG in here. Uh, the natural gas, I think, is what we're going to see really driving in terms of the energy in the future. Uh, but I gotta believe that most of what we're gonna produce is gonna stay right here in our own backyard. I can speak, one of the problems we do have, and we're just talking about some of the exports, let me give Ohio as an example. We're down to two refineries, okay? And neither one of them are located in Ohio, the Bios Ohio crude oil. Uh, one is in Newell, West Virginia, Ergon, which would be the old uh, Quaker State facility. The second is in Bradford, PA, the American Refining Group. It is the oldest refinery in the country. One of the problems that we have is refinery capacity. So what you're seeing is you're seeing a lot of this crude oil leaving the United States and coming back as a refined product because we have not built a refinery in over 40 years. Excuse me, this is refined petroleum products. And this yeah. is the first time in 20 yeah. years yeah. it's our top export. So there's something. There's a we have, we, we, one of our biggest concerns if we don't build a new refinery, we don't have a choice but to refine it in other countries, then bring it back at a more expensive cost. So one of the answers would be to allow us to build a petroleum refinery in this country.
in the schools and the opportunity to give them the truth. That's what we're trying to do with some of our education programs right now. And the answer is, uh, as long as the curriculum, I said it's very important that it meets state and national science standards, that's what we're bringing to the classroom so that it cannot, it is not viewed as any propaganda. Uh, the teachers, we had educators from around the state that helped us develop that particular curriculum. I think our industry as a whole, in the last several uh, generations, if you will, we've done a poor job educating, and that's why we don't, we have lost several generations to go into the energy fields. So the answer is we're trying, we're making up for some lost time uh, that unfortunately uh, is the industry's fault.
take a couple more. Mr. Tricomi had had his hand up for. You then we have to wrap up. Have it it there was a recent announcement of something being built, multi-million dollar facility just over the border in Pennsylvania. Yeah. Ask that again so they can hear. I, I may have missed it. You may have talked about a multi billion dollar. Shell cracking. So, yeah. But we, we really were hoping that was going to be in Ohio. That was going to be about 17,000 permanent jobs. What kind of facility is that? I'm sorry. Uh, that's called a cracking facility. Okay, so it is going to be doing, um, it's going to be processing shell uh, chemical. It's going to be processing a lot of that wet gas. It's different than a refinery. Um, it, it's processing natural gas and the natural gas liquids as opposed to, at least at this point, um, uh, the crude oil. Uh, so it's a processing and cracking facility. I really was hoping we were going to get that here in Ohio. But it's still going to mean a lot of jobs regionally. Okay, uh, thank you. You know, uh, isn't this a matter of refineries the, one of the big issues that came up uh, out the uh, Delaying the Keystone Pipeline with a refinery that could be or maybe should be constructed in the, on our northern border. Isn't that a part of it? That's a part of it. Yeah, and then that being the case, and I don't think as a politically active group as we are, we should uh, lose sight of the problems that we have with the EPA and our representatives in Washington about not getting on the ball here about this problem. Thank you. Um, may I finish answering? I just realized I did not answer this gentleman's question. You had asked me about property values. Because uh, I think it's very important if you don't mind. Um, this is the other thing. I work with Farm Bureau quite a bit. We've been doing a lot of these meetings for landowners. It is very important uh, that people, I think, and again, working with the insurance, working with the banking community, um, also with the realtor community, when people buy property, they should know whether or not they're buying their mineral rights. It's very important, okay? Um, I'm gonna give you an example because it does do with the property values. Uh, my brother uh, was buying one to 500 acres um, down in Lincoln County, uh, where I'm at, and um, I knew where he was. They were pretty excited, and I said, well, then what about your mineral rights? He goes, well, what do you mean by mineral rights? I knew that there were going to be wells on that property. It was easier for me to go into the county recorder's office. I knew some of the operators. And I said, Glenn, you need to buy your mineral rights. He went back to ask for those. The property value went up by $100,000. Okay? Um, obviously, you know, he could afford the extra 100000 I think it's still the reason why my sister-in-law hates me today. Uh, but the mineral rights, I mean, I can't emphasize this enough how important that is. Because if your property's been leased, and it could be for wind, it could be for timber, it could be for aggregates, it could be for coal, it could be for oil and gas. If you don't own the mineral rights, and that activity takes place, which it's allowed to, uh, underneath that original lease, and you try and sell the property, your property value could go down. If you own the mineral rights, and you try and sell it, uh, especially in the eastern part of Ohio, look at those property values right now. Especially when they're signing $5,000 an acre. Five years ago, it was ten to $25 an acre. Um, so it makes a big difference, and, and I apologize to you because I, I didn't get to that question. One other part of my question you didn't answer on the report that it, when any of the natural gas in Ohio would be liquefied down New Orleans export terminal and shipped to China? I would say right now no, and the reason for that is we only produce about 20% of our natural gas needs in Ohio. So we are currently pulling a lot up from the southwest and other parts of the state. Um, so the answer I would say would be no. If you look at even the Rockies Express that came through um, Ohio, that was natural gas coming out of the Rockies and actually going into primarily into the New England states where they were still relying a lot on fuel oil. So I would say right now, no on that side. You're also going to see a big insurgence on um, natural gas vehicles. I think it's going to start in communities. So it's going to be like city vehicles. Uh, it's going to be city buses. Um, just because you'll have refueling opportunities. So we just need too much to be exporting that. So the export terminals in New Orleans are to ship it where? Uh, I can't answer that for you. I apologize. I'll take one more. I'm not, I'm not. 
I know everything about drilling oil and gas well, refining. Um, you know, that's not my view. We call it the downstream side of the business. I'm not an expert in, in, in that part. I, I, yeah, you can't. I'm sorry, I somehow I got stuck next to the smartest guy in the room and you let him by suggesting you can't set it up. With natural gas, I've been listening to Tiemann, Tiemann Pitt was talking about converting vehicles to natural gas. How realistic is that? Do we have the infrastructure to do something like that? Do we have road trucks or anything? Or how we don't. Do and that's the problem. So everybody's talking about the chicken or the egg when it comes to natural gas vehicles. That's where I think we're going to start in communities with that. You're seeing a lot of uh, city buses, school buses, um, sanitation, you know, where they have refueling capabilities where they don't have to go a couple miles. Um, I travel a lot. I mean, I'm all over the eastern part of, of the state uh, every day. I'm all over the place. I would love to convert my vehicle to natural gas. Refueling is a problem for me. Okay? But they are moving towards that, just like you know, some of the electric cars. You can put an electric car in the house and you can plug it in. Um, they're looking at refueling stations in homes. Until you have that refueling, the consumers are not going to buy into it because they don't want to be stranded somewhere unless they can refuel it. Folks, it is 9 o'clock. <coughs> I think we need to wrap up. Unless you guys want to stay and ask a few more questions. But I'll stay. Yeah, you know. And I think people are pretty much yeah. But if, if you have a question for Ron, then she, I think she's going to stick around a few minutes. And uh, thank you very much for your wonderful presentation.